Okay, so the title of my sermon this morning is The Great Commission. Just wanted it to be a bit of a reminder sermon. Hey, this is what our church is about, right? So we think about what the purpose of our church is. We're reading Matthew 28 this morning because that's where we get the purpose of our church and the purpose of every church, right? In Matthew 28, what do we do? We evangelize, we baptize, and we discipleize, right? That's the word that they make up. <laughs> it rhymes. <laughs> All right, so when it comes to the Great Commission, we see that in Matthew 28, but we don't only see it in Matthew 28. It's actually mentioned in every gospel, right? And it's also mentioned in Acts. So we'll see here just the differences. So Mark 16, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Luke 24, we see the Great Commission here too. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer <coughs> and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So it's in John 20 as well. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So we do that by preaching the gospel. It's not that the apostles just had some special power that we don't. They did it by preaching people the gospel, you know, and the baptism for the remission of sins. That's what it represented, that our sins have been remitted. And that's why John the Baptist preached the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So not only is it in every gospel, this commission to go out and preach the gospel and teach people the word of God and to baptize them, we also see it in Acts 1 as well. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So that's the part of the chapter we want to focus on in Matthew 28 is at the end there where it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and, one, teach all nations, number two, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and number three, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now these are Jesus' last words before he ascended up to heaven. This is the, the purpose and the mission he left with his disciples, the last thing he said to them before he left. Now shouldn't we take heed to somebody's last words? You think about somebody who dies, right? Their last words to you are generally something very important. And this is why people call this the Great Commission. It's what we're here to do, not only as a church, but as an individual. So this morning, I want to teach about ways that we accomplish the Great Commission. That we accomplish the Great Commission. Because oftentimes, guys, and the sad thing is, the Great Commission in our life often becomes the Great Omission. Have you heard that one before? I've said it here before. But just a reminder, hey, the Great Commission in your life often becomes the great omission. It's the one thing you don't do in your life. And you're busy doing everything else, entertaining yourself, entertaining friends and family, working hard, spending your whole life doing anything but the Great Commission. So we want to make sure Great Commission is at the top of our priority. Right, because that's what we're here to do. That's why God he has works for you to do, and it's all about the Great Commission. Right? So the Great Commission, we don't want to make that the great omission. So let's talk about the first one: preaching the gospel. 
preaching the gospel. It says here, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We know it's referring to preaching the gospel there because you preach the gospel to people before you baptize them, right? Mark 16, 15 even says, right? Go ye into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, there are many different ways you can preach the gospel, right? We're going to go through them and I want to explain to you the reasons why door-to-door -door soul winning will always be a necessary part of our church. Is it the only way you can preach the gospel? No, but let me explain to you why it will always be a necessary part of, why, of how we get the gospel out there. Now, if you think about all the ways you can preach the gospel, how you can get the message out there, first of all, you can divide it between passive and proactive methods, right? So what is a passive method? Passive is you don't really do, you don't proactively bring it up with people. It's just passive. They actually ask you about it and you just go about living your life as a Christian person. Now, when we think about the Great Commission, the Great Commission is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Does it sound like Jesus will be happy with us just using passive methods of evangelism? What people call lifestyle evangelism? So what's lifestyle evangelism? Lifestyle evangelism is when you just live your life all godly and happy and peaceful, and then hopefully somebody asks you, oh man, like your life is so great, you're so at peace, you're so happy all the time, what is the answer? Like why are you like that? And they fall on their feet, you know, what must I do to be saved? And hey, this is your opportunity. And, and some people think, hey, your job is just to live your life as a Christian and just wait for those opportunities for people. But if they don't ask you about it, then you're all good. You're doing your part. You're being light and salt in the world. Now, does that sound like what Jesus had in mind when he said, go ye therefore and teach your nations? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He's not saying, hey, wait for the world to see you across the other side of the world and come to you and fly over or take a ship over. How, they, how would they even see you in those days, right? In those days, they didn't have the internet. So, What's, what are some of the problems though with lifestyle evangelism? Am I saying don't do it? Like if somebody sees your life and asks you about it, does that mean you don't give them the gospel? No, of course you would. So it's not that lifestyle evangelism isn't a part of every Christian's evangelism, how they go about the, the Great Commission, but why isn't it enough? Well, one, it only will work if being a Christian means some visibly positive effect. I mean, what if your life is worse than that person? You know, you may be a Christian. Are we like Joel Osteen in here? Are we like, hey, once you become a Christian, you're kind of healthy, wealthy and wise, you're going to have straight teeth, you're going to have a beautiful you know, wife, all that sort of stuff? I mean, if your life isn't something alluring to the world, which generally if you're a Christian, it's not going to be, why would they even want your life? You know, they want, you know they want, do they want the life where you get up early on Sunday morning, reading a, reading a book that they want nothing to do with, all that sort of stuff? So it only, it only will work if you have a visibly positive effect in order for somebody to want, to even want what you have. And that's why this whole lifestyle evangelism always becomes very materialistic because it's, it's all on the surface. It's all whether you're happy, whether you're rich, whether you've got your life in order, you know, or your children, things like that. So yeah, will it have some effect? Is it, is it completely worthless? No, but it's not enough. You know, what if they don't want what you have? I remember going soul winning once and we, and we, uh, we got to this guy's door and he said, look, look, Victor, you know, we live in the information age. You know, you don't have to go out and tell people if they want to know about it, they'll look it up. They can find the information. Is that the truth? Are people just going about their lives thinking about eternity, thinking about God, thinking about spiritual things? Oftentimes, even spiritual people, even people that are saved are not even thinking about those things when they go about their day-to-day -day life. How much less so the unsaved person who's going about their life not even seeking God, doesn't care about the things of God, doesn't even know any Christians, you think they're just going to, oh, maybe one of them is going to search up a website about Christianity and look it up. Because the truth of the matter is, guys, when you go out there and you knock the doors and you talk to people, they're not thinking about it. They're busy with life and we're hoping that when we go talk to them, that's going to be the time where they stop and at least consider it. And that's the truth of the matter. 
So these, the people out there that think, oh yeah, people, yeah, some people go out and seek it. But I'd say it's the minority because most people, they're busy with life. They're busy with the pleasures, the riches, the cares of this life and whatnot. So we have to go out there and wake them up. And this is why passive methods are not good enough. So what are some proactive methods? Proactive methods could be <coughs> broadcasting to the masses, right? So when you think about broadcasting to the masses, you can do advertising, billboards, posters, radio, TV, social media. Now what's the problem there? It costs a lot of money. It's cost and it's talented, talent prohibitive. Now is it something good to do? Yeah, sure, you know, if you have the money and you think it's something worthwhile and effective, you know, a church might put billboards up here and there. But what do you do when you don't have the thousands and thousands of dollars to spend on money, to on advertising? It costs a lot. Not only that, it's not interactive. So if you think about advertising, usually you need to get people's attention for a couple of seconds. You've got a couple of seconds. You know, it's not interactive. If they have any questions, what's going to make them reach out to you? And that's why it's always, you know, it's trying to entice people to come and ask questions to get those leads. And advertising, if you're going to them, if they don't respond to it and somehow contact you or get in contact, it's not good at communicating complex ideas, is it? Like if you need to explain things and there's a bit of interaction involved, advertising is not going to cut it. You say, well, no, not, not a billboard, not a sign, not a poster. We're going to open air preaching. We're going to have somebody there preaching the gospel to just people walking by. I have done open air preaching. I'm not against necessarily people want to do that. Like I said, if people want to do these things, they're not wrong in and of themselves. I just want to explain to you why I think door knocking is the most effective of, of these methods in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Now with open air preaching, if I said, hey, we're going to go you know, somewhere busy and go, hey, who wants to go next after I go up? Most people would be like, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to like, speak here, let alone speak somewhere where hundreds of people might be looking at me. So when I think of open air preaching, I think that you know, rather than a billboard, the person is now the billboard. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you can't pay necessarily for the billboard or the poster, but now somebody is going to be there, put in their human resources and be that billboard. And sometimes when you're open air preaching, you know, you need ways to maybe draw a crowd and things like that, so you can do that and, and that sort of thing. But it takes a lot of boldness, requires a loud voice. Not everyone can do it. And it's not interactive. Because just preaching a message, hoping people are listening, right? And they're just going by, they're even just going to catch just a couple of seconds of your speech. Now, if you come off the soapbox and go and start talking to people, I would say that's a different method to open air preaching. So, right? So, I wouldn't include, you know, the open air preaching is the person standing on a box, preaching to people, hoping people are listening. I wouldn't count it as the person who gets off the box, right? And says, hey, did you understand what I was saying? And you talk to people, and maybe there are people with them, talking to people that are listening. So sometimes when you go to a public area, there can be a combination of open air preaching and those things. Now, what's another way you can broadcast to the masses? Well, you can host a public event, like church is a public event, movie night, gospel meeting, documentary, concert, musical. Maybe you can do something like you can create a museum, like the Creation Museum, or some sort of exhibit where you're trying to get people to come to this thing that you've created, this, this event that you've hosted. Now, once you've done all the work to set it up, done all the rehearsals, all the planning, everything, let me ask you, how are you going to get people to this event? Well, you're either going to default to advertising, which costs a lot of money, or you're going to need volunteers to go and tell people. Letterbox, door knock. Right? So even if you host an event, you're only halfway there. Because now you've got to get the bums in the seat. Right? Just like church. Man, if hosting an event worked, then you know, where are all the unbelievers here? We don't we have to we have to get them here, right? So either it's like for church or it's it's to an event. So this is when you start getting to, rather than broadcasting to the masses, right, and there are pros and cons there, cost, talent, 
boldness in terms of public areas, the effort to put on an event, maybe it's worth it if you then take the effort to try and get them to that event. Right? But see, you might make all this effort talking to people to get them to an event, and if they don't come, you may as well have just tried to talk to them while you were trying to get them to the event. <laughs> Am I right? So this is why. What methods are there when it comes to engaging individuals? Right? Just going up and talking to somebody, having a conversation, hoping you can strike up a conversation and go about it. Well, let's start first of all with how most people would do it. Just, just approaching people you know. Right? So not passively doing it. So it's not like life where you're just waiting for them to ask you about your Christianity. I mean like proactively, purposefully, trying to find opportunities where you have some time alone or you have them away or you make an appointment with them to go see somebody in your family, your friends, your colleagues, or even random people you meet out, purposefully trying to bring up the conversation and bring up the gospel. Now that's great, and everybody should be doing it. But let me ask you, what do you do when you run out of people to talk to? What happens when you've spoke to every family member? What happens when you've spoke to all your friends and all your colleagues? I mean, most of us do not interact with hundreds of people every day. You know, some of us might, but if you do, generally you're working. So, you know, when you're on your work, you, know, you shouldn't be spending, spending the boss's time preaching the gospel to people. So you shouldn't be doing it like, if you're out on a job, you should be doing the job. You shouldn't be preaching the gospel, right? Because you have to go, you have an obligation to your boss. So what happens when you run out of people to preach to? And this is what I find when people say, well, I just preach to my colleagues or I preach to my family. That's great. And you ought to. But are you, you're not talking to them every week, right? It might be, oh, the next time I see you, the next family meeting or this and that. And maybe you'll make up some appointments, go talk to your family. But what happens when you run out of people? What happens when you've talked to everybody? Then what are you going to do? Right? So it needs to be more than that. Because eventually you will. Yeah, you may be saved for one year, two years, you still have some family to talk about. You go, oh, well, you know, I've got that distant cousin. Next time I see them at the family reunion, I'm going to try and talk to them. And that reunion is like six months away. So you're going to do nothing for six months? You're not going to do anything for God? Just thinking, one, I'm going to take that opportunity? Because that's, that's what it inevitably turns into, guys. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, the people that say, oh, I just talk to family and colleagues and stuff, you know, that, you know as, as, that's how it is. I'm just being honest with you, because that's what people do. And, and for months and months on end, they're not doing anything for God. And then they, when they get there, and then it's like, oh, well, I didn't get the opportunity at the party. Too busy. Next time, next one. Yeah. And then it's just like, gets put on for it. So that's, that's, that's how it is, right? And you say, well, well I'm, I'm approaching random people as I go out about my day. Yeah, yeah, well, if you're not busy enough to go out and about, and approach people, I would say that's exactly the same as soul winning. You know, like that's the point. Like if, you're go, if, you, if you go out and make it a point, I'm going to go meet some random people at the shops or whatever. Oh, you know, I've got some time off at work, so I'm just going to go meet some random people in the local area and talk to them and preach the gospel. That's great. Because that's exactly the same thing, right? It's just setting a time aside to go, look, I've, 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 I, I do lifestyle evangelism. I talk to people that I know. I even like proactively try and talk to people I know as well. But when I run out of those people, you know what? I'm going to proactively, like Jesus says, go ye therefore, go ye into the world, all the world. Proactively go at a time where I will meet somebody I've never met before and hopefully strike up a conversation, give them the gospel and wake them up to the truth of hell, to the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, why do we do it at certain times? At church, you know, we have a time on Sunday afternoon to go door knocking. That's just to support us. Because chances are, you're not going to be bold enough, if you've never done soul winning before, to just go out on your own and do it. So this is why there are organized times where you can say, hey, come along, be a silent partner, go along with somebody who's been doing it a few, you know, for longer, a bit more bold, and you can get involved. And you know what? That's one way where you can see what happens out soul winning when we talk to strangers and you know what? That's going to even give you a better chance of getting your family member saved. Because, you know, I think it's better that you train on strangers so that when you talk to somebody you love and you get one opportunity, that you're ready. But if you do it the other way around, you know what happens with new believers? 
They're too scared to talk to strangers. They burn all their bridges with the people they know, being too zealous. And they say, oh, why did you get this? You idiot. You know, have that conversation with somebody you don't know. You know, at least, you know, at least they'll be a bit more forgiving because they don't know you. But when you have it with your family, you don't necessarily want to burn those bridges so that, you know, you can be a bit more prepared and then you'll come across as someone who's more sober, thought it through. So that to me is wiser. So people you know, of course, reach people you know, but it's not enough. So you say, why don't we go to a public area? We go to a public area, there's a lot of people there, we'll go talk to people. I'm all for that, but let me give you the reasons why I don't think it's as good as, as door knocking. Right, don't, as, good, as good as going house to house. Now, when people are out and about, this is just my opinion, when people are out and about, generally, they're, they're doing errands. You know, like when I go to the shops, I'm not just going there to just bum around. You know, you go in your shops, you've got to do something, you've got to do, you go here, go there, you're on the move. Now, if you're just approaching people that are just there sort of chilling in the area, well, then you've got to ask the question, well, what about the, per what about the people that don't visit that spot? Don't you want to reach them as well? Because I've done it too, guys. It's not like I don't talk from experience. Like I, I used to do with the church. We used to go street evangelism, go to the same location. And you know what I found? It, there was like the same people there every week sometimes because it's like the same people in the city just bumming around. And generally the people that are bumming, they're the ones that want to talk to you. But you, you notice it's like the same people, right? And it's a certain type of people too that are just out because the busy people technically are there going about their day. So, but everybody lives somewhere. Now, not only that, one of the issues I find with public spaces is like if you approach somebody, I mean, have you ever been approached by an evangelist in a public space? Or well, not even that, but a salesperson in the shopping centre, right? And you kind of think like, oh, you know, especially if it's a bit of a controversial topic. Let's say you're sitting at a bus stop and there's like 10 people at the bus stop and then you get, hey, you're going to be like, why me? I'm talking about it in front of everyone. So I'm naturally like that. Maybe you're not. So I just think, I don't want to put somebody in that situation if I don't have to, right? I'd rather like have them somewhere where, you know, if they want to brush me off, they don't want to feel embarrassed with other people watching, nobody else can hear the conversation that they don't know, that sort of thing. So you've got that issue with public spaces. And then second of all, also for yourself, like you require more boldness, don't you? Because you now have to approach a larger group or you have to approach people where people can see what you're doing and things like that. Now, does that necessarily make it wrong? No, but all I'm saying is that there are some barriers there to doing it that way. But one of the downfalls, I think, of only going to one spot is that you will only reach the people that go to that spot. So you're not going to the people that don't go to that spot. But you see, everybody lives somewhere. And I know there are verses we use to talk about going house to house. Acts 5, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Luke 14, verse 21. So that servant came, so this is talking about the, the supper that the king made. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry. Why? Because the initial people he invited didn't come. Said, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. So I understand the argument. Yes, you know, they didn't have the technology we have today, and maybe they don't have all the methods we have today. That's why they had to go house to house. But I'm trying to give you some reasons today why I think this method is timeless why it would always apply, why it will always be needed. Because, guys, what can compare, cost-benefit-wise even, to just going to where people live and talking to them? Everybody lives somewhere, right? So we want to reach people in this area. If we knock every door in this area, we will at least have reached them with a pamphlet, tried to talk to them. But if we only go to one area, then the question is, why go to one area? Why not just go to every area? Just, just, just canvas the neighbourhood. There's, there's a lot of benefits to why it's easier. You get into a conversation. It's private. They're, you know, they're happier even to tell you to go get stuffed, right? Because they're in their house. So you don't have to worry about making somebody feel awkward and all that sort of stuff. But if you do get into a conversation, it's the perfect situation. It's private. They're in their comfort zone. 
You know, and I understand, you know, not everybody's comfortable with it, but what are your alternatives? People say, well, people get upset at you when you talk to them about the gospel. That happens in every situation. You know, somebody that doesn't want you to talk to them about the gospel is not going to like you talking to them on the street, in a public place, inviting them to an event. They're not going to like it anyway, right? So we're not doing it to please people. We're doing it to be effective. Because, like I said, what can compare to just walking up to somebody that you don't know, trying to strike up a conversation and trying to give them the gospel if they're interested. You've got the private setting, it's comfortable, you're coming to their domain, everybody lives somewhere. Now let me, let me ask you this question. Let's say, and um, we don't do this yet because we don't have enough money even to support our church, but you know, some, yeah, our churches give money to mission, missionaries. You send this guy over into the mission field. You know, I'm going to go reach the lost in Africa, you know. And it's always like in Africa, right? Because and Africa probably has more independent churches than we have here. Yeah. It's gonna, you're going to go into Africa, into, the, into this place, and reach the people over there. Now, let's say you were, say you ex what you were expecting from that guy is, you know, they're going to go in that church. Yeah, you're thinking they're going to reach that area. And then you go there and you realise, man, they haven't even reached the person that lives two blocks away. They haven't even reached the person that lives over in the other suburb. Actually, what they did and all the money you're sending them, they started a YouTube channel. And then they're just spending money on AV equipment, starting a radio station. And you, and you look at the demographics of their listeners, it's all Americans. Right? Something like that. Wouldn't you just think, that is so disappointing, that picture. Don't you think if a church is in an area that they should at least reach the person across the road at least put a letter at least put a leaflet in their box at least knock on their door hey we're here you know and then you just think it's the same two blocks away it's the same that's suburb over them i mean if we if we don't reach the people in this area who's, who's gonna do it yeah. i mean we're the only church in this area that is reaching the people in the area so everybody can be spending their money trying to get people out. but what about the person that hasn't hooked into them and this is why, guys, when it comes down to it, politicians and salespeople, they still do it. Because if a local person, think about your local tradesman, if they want to get some business, what do they normally do? They letterbox, don't they? Or they have to spend a lot of money on advertising in the local area, right? which just comes down to cost. But politicians, they, they would love, you know, if they could have an army of volunteers go out and knock the doors and talk to people talking about their policies, letterbox, that is gold to a politician. And in fact, you know, my friend who's a politician in WA, you know, sometimes people volunteer, you know, on election day and stuff like that. So he gets like a team of volunteers. And just because he stood up in that area, nobody in his party was standing up in that area, he got a bunch of volunteers, he manned the booths, he did the letterboxing, and then he, could, and then he took 8% of that area just because of his efforts, right? So they know that if there is a grassroots group of people doing that work, that's the most effective way to reach a local area. So this is why we knock doors. Right? This is why it will always be a necessary part. Because what can compare? If we want to reach people in that suburb over from us, what can compare to just going to their houses and letterboxing it, trying to talk to them, you know, the only other way is we're going to hope to meet them in a public area. We're going to hope our advertising gets them, hope all this stuff. But if we just go to their house, we know at least, hey, that's one way we can systematically try and reach everybody. So these are all the different methods. I'm just giving you my reason why, hey, I think door knocking is the best. But how are you contributing in this area? Could you be doing more? And, you know, giving money is not enough. You know, some people say, some people think, you know, well, hey, well, I just work hard. I'll give money. And, I, and, some, and the people that want to do that, they're going to go do it. But why is it not enough? Right? Because money is not what's in shortage when it comes to the gospel. Right? You only need so much money. You know, you, yeah, you can get, do more advertising and everything. But if you need to reach this area, what do you need? You need people. You need laborers. That's the limited resource. So yeah, it's great. You know, people give to the ministry. We keep this thing going. But giving money is not enough. Look what Jesus says here in Matthew 9. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest 
truly is plenteous. Look at this. But the laborers are few. The laborers are few. That's what's lacking. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth money into his harvest? No. He will send forth laborers. Because that's what's short. What's short is the people. Because you know what? I'm all for letterboxing. Letterboxing is fine. You know, people, you know, they want to transition into soul winning. Hey, get out there. We want to start people letterboxing as well to get you used to going out there and preaching the gospel. But you know what? If we had the money, we could pay the postman to go out and drop the letterboxes in. But you know what I can't pay the postman to do? To be a bold, spirit-filled Christian, open the Bible and preach the gospel to somebody. That's what you can't pay somebody to do. That's why you need God's people to do that. You need the laborers to go into the harvest to do that. And yes, we do it in our lives. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not saying it's either or. It's all of them. All I'm saying is doing all the other ones is not enough. And that's why we need to fill that last gap. That last gap is the people you don't know that live in this area. The only way we're going to get to them is we go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. All right, now the Great Commission is not only preaching the gospel. I just wanted to spend some time there because I wanted to remind you guys that's one of the main ones. Second is baptizing believers. Baptizing believers. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, <coughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, a story in Acts 8, I think, is a very fitting story when it comes to the Great Commission, because I think it's got like all elements you know, here. In terms, well, it's got the first two elements, at least. Acts 8, this is where Philip comes across the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. So I don't know if you've ever read the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, but it's interesting that he's here in his chariot and he's reading from Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to his chariot. Now look, Philip didn't do the lifestyle evangelism. He wasn't just going about his day and the Ethiopian eunuch looked out of his chariot and go, hey, that's a happy man. I wonder what's making him so happy you know go and talk to him no the spirit bade philip go talk to him and philip ran thither to him look at that look at the, look at the enthusiasm and the zeal it's like when people go soul winning right it's just like you know trying to do their time you know it's like okay i know victor said we've got to go for an hour so just like walk to the next house talk a bit you know like when you go from house to house like get to the next house quickly you know you only got so much time you know be like philip you don't run, but you know, have some haste. You know, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? So it's almost like Isaiah, you kind of think that the scriptures is like the ad. And somebody's got questions. And like I was telling you, it's like ads aren't interactive. But if you go and preach the gospel to somebody, they have questions. Hey, you're there to help them try and understand. And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people that would desire that we can explain it or give us the opportunity to. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. So you can always get this picture here that they've got a Bible open in front of them and he's preaching him the gospel. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken away from him. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, so he's like, I'm asking you, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? So the eunuch says, hey, when he's reading Isaiah, and he's reading Isaiah 53, if you go back to Isaiah 53, you can see that that's where those scriptures are from. So they're reading Isaiah 53, and then the eunuch asks Philip, hey, is the guy talking about himself? Was he talking about somebody else, right? Because when you're reading from the prophets, you don't always know whether it's prophetical. Like David, like when David said, you know, who shall not leave my soul in hell, that's like, hey, we explain in the New Testament, that's not David, David isn't in hell. That's him actually talking prophetically about Jesus. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture 
and preached unto him Jesus. So you can see it's similar to like when we preach the gospel. We'll go to a passage, we'll explain it, and then he begins there and then he preaches the gospel. And you want to have some flexibility, right? Like if you're already there, so he's talking to him from, from where he is rather than having just this canned presentation that you get people to go through. You want to have a bit of flexibility and engage them. Yes, it's good to have a script and to know, hey, what I want to go through, but make sure you're interacting with the person, that you're not just getting them, taking them through some sales pitch that they're not even asking questions about or even listening. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities, <coughs> till he came to Caesarea. So when we baptize people, obviously we want to baptize them correctly. You know, we want to baptize them by immersion. That's why they had to go into the water. And we baptize believers only. That's why we don't baptize children. So he says, what doth hinder me to be baptized? if thou believest with all thine heart. So you don't want to contribute to baptizing children as well. And this is the problem when people marry Catholics and Orthodox and you have the family pressure. You as a Bible believer end up compromising. Okay, you keep them happy, baptize kids. Well, then you're not helping to keep the Great Commission, right? Because the Great Commission, we need to baptize people. We baptize them correctly, right? But then we're just like baptizing children. We're not baptizing believers. We're not doing as Philip did. So people will say, well, how can I contribute to this when in church, mostly the leaders baptize me? Victor only baptized. How am I keeping this? Well, a couple of thoughts is one is, you know, are you baptized? You know, you're not baptized. That's one way you can keep the Great Commission. But secondly, even though you're not performing the baptize, have you ever tried encouraging somebody to get baptized? Yeah, that's one way you can help support the Great Commission in this area. You say, like, well, I don't do the baptizing. Yeah, well, just like you try to preach the gospel, the people that you preach the gospel to or you get saved or the people that you know are saved that aren't baptized, that's one way you can take part in the Great Commission. You say, hey, why don't you should get baptized? Now, I admit in, in this church, I kind of do baptisms in the warmer months just because we do them at the river. So we can do, you know, have a bit of a van, have a bit of a celebration. But if somebody was adamant about, hey, I want to go get baptized and like I don't care about anyone looking at it, then we'll go to the cold river and I'll baptize you. I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. But if you're saved, you know, but that's way, one way you guys can take part in that step of the Great Commission, is that you can encourage also people. It's not just my job to ask people if they're baptized and encourage people. The Great Commission is for all of us. Right? So all of us need to evangelize. All of us need to take part in that. And, and technically, you know, if you want to really be technical, anybody can technically baptize. Right? Like if, 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 a, if a believer, if you're in a remote area somewhere, or believe, even here, a believer was to baptize another believer, that's just as valid as me doing the baptism. But why do we do it like that in our church? Because that's the example we see in the New Testament. We don't really see unordained people, people not in leadership baptizing people. It's always people that are ordained, or it's people, it's deacons, you know, people that God has asked for people to baptize, or bishops, right? So you just think, hey, that's why usually it's reserved for the leadership. But it's technically not a sin in and of itself. You know, it's not wrong, it doesn't mean they're not baptized. And then, uh, you know, just when it comes to order in a church, we just have a way that I like to do it, um, just for, for practicality's sake and logistics sake. All right, so that's about it. Let's talk about the last one. And this is the one that often gets forgotten when you hear preaching on the Great Commission. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about preaching the gospel, but remember, there's three areas to the Great Commission. It's baptizing, it's, ba it's, uh, it's evangelizing, baptizing, but there's also making disciples. Right? So the Great Commission doesn't end when the person gets saved. Right? The Great Commission doesn't end with you just preaching the gospel. The Great Commission continues, like in Matthew 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now how are you going to help teach somebody to observe all things when you don't know all things? So you see how the Great Commission includes you knowing the Bible to you knowing the Word of God so that you can take part in this. I cry, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So it's not the, the creating disciples 
It's not just about preaching the Bible in church. So, so some people think, yeah, well, we can take part in the Great Commission by preaching the gospel like Victor's talking about, you know, in your know, lifestyle evangelism and talking to your friends and advertising, door knocking and public areas and all these sorts of methods. And like I said, I think the best one's door knocking. <clears throat> but it's not just Victor baptized, like I said. You guys, you guys can encourage people to baptize, get baptized, you know, talk to people there. Also, when it comes to teaching people, am I the only one teaching people the Bible? No, right? Because the Bible teaching and Bible counsel and all that sort of stuff doesn't just come from the pulpit on Sunday morning. Look at these verses here, Romans 15. <coughs> and I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. Oh, well, see, Paul is talking about the Romans here. Able also to admonish one another. See, this is what I'd love our church to get to. You know, I don't want everyone in church saying, oh, you know, I don't know, ask Victor. I don't know, go talk to Victor. I don't know, you better talk to Victor about this. I want you guys to grow to the point where if somebody comes to you with a struggle, that you can give them some biblical advice. And hopefully we would give them the same advice because we're reading the same book. Right? But able to admonish one another, to correct one another, to exhort one another. That's what we want our church to be. Right? But it's only going to be that if you guys take the Great Commission seriously and learn yourself the things that you need to learn. Galatians 6, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So see, it requires some level of spirituality to be able to help somebody else. And we bear one another's burdens. It's not the bishops bear everybody's burden. The deacons bear everybody's burden, right? That's not ideal. That's what happens oftentimes in churches. But ideally, the situation is you guys understand your responsibility as a believer, your responsibility in the Great Commission, and you help bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Right? So here's a couple of questions, right? We'll talk you through some verses and some challenges for you, you know? Are you learning so that you can discuss things with people? You know, are you reading your Bible, Luke 4? Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Look at what it says here in Deuteronomy 6. And, uh, you know, the first couple of verses, you know, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. And these words, look at this, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. See, so before you go on to teach your children where they need to be first, in you, they shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk of them, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Does that sound like God is just expecting you to raise your children by just getting a bit of Bible on Sunday mornings? No, it's a lifestyle. It's you knowing the Bible and every opportunity you get trying to teach your children the Word of God, trying to point them back to Jesus Christ, trying to relate things that they understand in light of the Bible. So are you learning so that you can teach others, so that you can help others? Are you present? You know, some people don't even come to get this. Oh, this is not even enough. But some people don't even come to church frequently enough to get this, right? And to be part of the community here. Let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. Again, see how it's not just let the bishops consider everybody. It's let us consider one another, right? Because the Great Commission isn't only done by me. It's done by all of us. And to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So are you learning? Are you present? You know, are you even there to learn? What about your example? Are you doing it? You know, can somebody point to you and say, hey, look, this is how a Christian should act. This is how a Christian should dress. This is how a Christian should talk. This is how a Christian behave, should behave. 
We want everyone in this church to be somebody where we can look to the young children of this church and go, look, do as they do. Be like the men in church. Be like the ladies in church. That's what I want one day. I'd love this church to be like that. I want it for your kids as well. Not just for my kids. You know, I want my kids to have role models that are not just me. Hey, I want your kids to have role models as well. So I think about that. And you guys should think about that too as you live your Christian life. How do you live? Are you a good example? To the young, 1 Timothy 4, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. A lot of different areas of life. But not only for the young, but for the old as well. Because look here at 1 Peter 5, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but look at this, but being examples, an example to the flock. So our responsibility to be an example isn't just when we're young. And this is for those of us who are older. We don't want to get that mentality where it's, I fought the good fight, I did it when I was young, now it's you guys' to turn to take over and, and let our older people bow out of the fight. No, young and old, we need everybody in the Great Commission because everybody's got to play their part. And I say this to older people all the time, not just the people in our church. I've said this to older preachers out and about. I went to this meeting once and this older preacher came over to me. It was a political meeting, right? He's like, hey, he's like, you know, you're good. You're young. You've got the energy. You know, you can do all these things. And I'm like, yeah, but look, I said to him, like, but, but us young people, we need you to be in the fight as well because you know what? You have the influence. You have the respect that I can't get from somebody older than me. So I need old and young in the fight if we're going to be effective, right? So don't bow out of the fight just because you're later, later along in the time scale. Now, what about your relationships with one another? We're talking about how can you help fulfill the Great Commission? And I don't want you to just think that preaching the Bible up here is the only way that we teach the Bible and we admonish one another and things like that. So if you're going to admonish one another, if you're going to consider one another, if you're going to bear one another's burdens, this is why I emphasize in this church, your relationships with one another is so important. And this is why, you know, the more I pastor this church, the more I just realize why it's like love, 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 love. It's like love one another. We need love. Because you know what? It's hard to do. And when you know people so well, it's hard to love people that get on your nerves and frustrate you and step on each other's toes and all that sort of stuff, right? So it's like we need love. Right? We need unity and we're getting, that's why our relationships matter. So you think, hey, what's one way I can help the Great Commission in this church? Hey, I'm not going to be the guy that gets offended. I'm not going to be the guy that's trying to rub people the wrong way. I'm going to be the guy that tries to listen and, you know, trying to love people, trying to be a friend. And as the relationships strengthen in this church, so does the Great Commission. Why? Because you know what? It's just natural that babes in Christ, they want to serve with people that they're friends with. I want to serve with people that are like, you know what? A babe in Christ, you know, a, a mature Christian ought to be in church anyway. But you know what a babe in Christ does? Ah, who else is going? Hey, call people night. Hey, you going to church? Hey, you going to that event? That sort of thing. Hey, you going to be there? Okay, okay, if you're going, I'll go. That's what they do, right? So that's why it's very important that we try and make friends so then you're that person that they'll be excited to come see, right? I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. See, forbearing one another in love. What's the difference between forgiveness and forbearing? Well, forbearing is when you put up with each other. Forgiveness is when somebody says sorry, and then you say, I forgive you. But if they don't ask for forgiveness, then you have to forbear. You've got to, do, you've got to deal with it. You've got to love them, right? Endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Right? That's what we all have to do. The relationships that we have in our church. So that's why you've got to ask yourself, you know, are you 
helping to build and strengthen the relationships of this church or are you a hindrance to the relationships in this church you don't want to be a hindrance right you want to be a blessing to the relationships here because you know what if you don't this is what happens look here in galatians 5 for brethren ye have been called unto liberty so we have the freedom to do certain things you know say certain things and you know we can we can have that attitude of well i'm allowed to say this no matter if it upsets people and that sort of stuff but it says here hey, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another so why does god grant us this liberty the purpose of your liberty was not to hurt others upset others the purpose of that liberty is so that you could love one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself but but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that ye be not consumed one of another this i say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh so we better take heed guys and why it's so important in any church because a church is not just a group of sinners but it's a group of sinners that know each other well and are comfortable with each other and start grinding each other the wrong way and that's why love you know take heed don't bite and devour one another take heed that you be not consumed one of another and oftentimes that happens when a church is not focused on the great commission did you know that yeah. because when you're not focused on the great commission and your goal is outward it starts becoming oh this person in church said this or they did that and they didn't say hello to me you know they didn't go to my birthday party i went to their birthday party and i invited them to my wedding and then come to my wedding but those things diminish when at least you can come together hey look these are not as important because we have a common goal a bigger goal and that's to bring the gospel and you may even put your differences aside for the sake of a newer believer and say look we want to at least set a good example for the new believer right it's the same so take heed to that are you a hindrance to the relationships or are you a blessing when people think of you in church are they refreshed by your presence you know this is what we want to aim for hey we're not all there and then yeah it's going to be up and down i'm just giving you hey this is what we're striving for in this church look at this in first corinthians 16 i am glad of the coming of stephanus and fortunatus and archaicus for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied look at this for they have refreshed my spirit and yours therefore acknowledge ye them that are such right so we have to have those good relationships and we have those good relationships like we talked about when we talked about friendships then that allows us to be able to admonish and correct one another because you know what guys you need to earn the right to be able to counsel somebody and correct them you know it's not the spiritual thing to do just to go around just correcting everybody yeah i know what the right answer is because you know what you're just going to burn a lot of bridges but what you have to do first is try and develop a relationship with people if you develop a relationship people they know they're your friends don't you take do the same you will take counsel more from somebody that you know cares about you and it's not just out to make themselves feel better than you and all that sort of stuff there's a lot of relationship things that go on between people so are you refreshing to have around you know you want to try and be refreshing to people spiritually as well as physically but look at this proverbs 27 open rebuke is better than secret love faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful so we need to be friends first if we want to correct people right otherwise we fall prey to what it says in matthew 7 i won't read it all for sake of time but look at what it says here because we know matthew 7 is about correcting people right why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye and behold as a beam is in thine own eye right but look at what it says here give not that which is holy unto the dogs neither cast ye your pearls before swine and we're talking about the wisdom you're helping to correct somebody now if they don't want it from you he says hey give not that which is holy unto the dogs neither cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you 
So notice what happens here. When you give somebody advice or wisdom that they don't want, they're not ready to receive, they don't want to talk to you about it, you're just casting your pearls before swine. And you know what? They're not going to appreciate it. They're going to trample it under their feet and oftentimes they get angry with you. But if you can develop those friendships, those relationships, then it's more likely that you won't be casting your pearls before swine. And you know, don't take, don't take this verse and say, ah, oh, you know, these swine, these dogs. You know, that's not, that's not the point of this verse, right? It's just, you know, have that mentality if it's not the right situation. You know, because obviously this can be referring to unbelievers as well, people that are actually, you know, can be considered dogs and swines as well in this world. Now lastly, i got one more, is when we talk about the Great Commission, we talked about one another here in church, but parents especially. That's one way you can fulfill the Great Commission, is are you teaching your children? Are you teaching your children? Now, why have I got this verse up here? Because some parents, wrongly so, think this is the only way they teach their children. Now, am I for this? Let's see what it says. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, the King James Bible obviously uses this terminology, but you know, we would think of beat today as abusing our children, right? We're not abusing them. We're not trying to injure them, but we are hitting them with something to cause some pain as a motivator. Now, I, I, you guys know I believe in this wholeheartedly, right? This is, a, this is something that I think must be done, and it's the most, one of the most effective ways to punish your children. And you guys know that too. But what I want to remind you guys today is this is not the only way you teach your children. And oftentimes people in churches like ours that believe in spanking, they get this very unbalanced. Don't fall into the trap that, that you think you can correct everything about your child just with this. Because you know what? Just hitting them when they have no idea what they're doing wrong, and then you haven't tr trained them to do the right thing, you haven't taught them the Bible, you haven't taught them to, do, to behave the right way, that's not necessarily going to work all the time. You know, so this can't be the only thing you do. If the only thing you do with your children is spank them, when they do what you don't like, and you don't spend time talking to them, training them, like in Deuteronomy 6, teaching them when you get up, when you lie down, when you walk by the way, this is not gonna, this is not gonna do what you need it to do. Yes, because you can't think about just at your workplace. If all your boss did was just punish you every time you did something wrong, I mean, what sort of employee would you be? You know, you probably wouldn't even wanna work there. You know, so there's encouragement, there's training. What if the boss, what if the boss spanked you for something you didn't even know was wrong? You, know, you get upset with your children, they did, you spank them. Did you even first teach them the right way to do it? Teach them the right way to do it, explain it to them, you know? Then if they do it again, at least you then have some justification for why you spank them. So, spanking them. But that's not enough. We need to train our children. So at the very least, you know, if we're not in the Great Commission teaching unbelievers, teaching believers in church, at the very least, parents, do not neglect the training and teaching of your children at home. Do you know what I mean? You've got the best, you got the best chance with them. You've got one up on the world. They live with you. You've got to raise them. Don't miss that opportunity. And ye fathers, Ephesians 6, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Right? So nurture is you caring for them, admonition is you correcting them. But correcting them is not always about punishing them. Right? So punishing them is the spanking. Correcting them is saying, hey, you did this wrong. This is how you're meant to do it. Let me show you. I love you. Hugs and kisses. You know, all that sort of stuff. This is the sort of parent we have to be. And ye fathers, and ye fathers, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Because I see it in this church as well, guys. Too much of you guys are leaving it all to your wives. Leaving it all for getting, you know, the wife is doing all the spanking. 
Wife is doing all the discipline. Wife is doing all the correction. Wife is looking after all the children. Wife is teaching them. Wife is training them. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're meant to be leading. You need to be involved, guys. You need to support your wives and help your wife train your children. Don't just leave it to your wife to teach your children good habits. Don't just leave it to your wife to make sure your children finish all their food. Don't just leave it to your wife to make sure they're clean and decently dressed and organized and speak well and all that sort of stuff. You, fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's to you first, right? And your wife is supporting you. Okay, so don't, and it's easy to do, guys, and that's why I'm trying to hound this point home. Because yes, I get it, you're busy, you got work on your mind. And I know women are meant to be in the home, taking care of the home. And this is why I think God has this here, to remind you that you are meant to be first and foremost responsible for the training, the nurture and admonition of your children. The nurture of your children. You think like, yeah, I'm the dad, I come down hard on my kids. Yeah, I do the spanking. You know, it's their fear, they fear me. Do they get some nurture from you as well? kisses, some hugs, some playtime, some love. You know what I mean? So don't forget that. And this is the last verse I've got for you. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail. I just think that's a great reminder. Because you know what? If you sow iniquity in your children, you're going to reap vanity. And you know what happens to parents that do that? Kids misbehave, they grow up and they rebel. And then they get angry. Oh, I can't believe you did that, you useless, whatever. And that's why the Bible says, hey, the rod of your anger, that's not going to work. Because you've already not, you haven't trained up a child in the way it should go, so when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Training, okay, not just spanking. Right? Because too many fundamental circles get it wrong. And, and, and God forbid this church becomes a church where it's like just a bunch of abused children. You know, make sure you're not spanking your children too hard, guys. You know, there is a difference between abuse and correction, right? So correct your children, make sure it hurts, don't injure them, don't abuse them, right? And make sure you love them and care for them, because if you don't, you know what, they're going to grow up resentful, and then the rod of your anger is going to fail. So how are you contributing to the Great Commission? Evangelism, baptism, and making disciples, all right? Don't make the Great Commission the Great Omission in this church, and in your life. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, to make sure we always have the Great Commission as the central focus of this church and the central focus of our lives. Help us, Lord. We've come short, and I just pray, Lord, that you will use us, not only with unbelievers, but with the believers in this church, and Lord, help us to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.